Hey Math 237 students, Zach here. In our last video, we talked about setting up and evaluating double integrals over certain regions in the xy plane. Specifically, we learned how to integrate over rectangles, that's where x and y are both bounded between constants, and we learned how to integrate over what I called regions of type 1 and regions of type 2. These are regions where one of the variables, let's say x, is bounded between two constants, whereas the other variable, y in this case, is bounded between two functions, two functions of x. But in certain situations, you may have to integrate over more complicated regions, regions that can't be so easily viewed as just type 1 or type 2. Here's an example where this occurs. In this example, we're looking to compute this nasty double integral over this region D. Now we could try to set up our integrals just like we did in the last lesson, but I think you'll quickly see that the bounds this time are a bit more complicated. After all, if we imagine moving vertically throughout this region, the y values are always bounded above by this larger circular arc, which has the equation y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared. But for the lower bound, we see that sometimes the small circular arc is the lower bound for x values between 0 and 1, but for x values between 1 and 2, it's the x-axis that's the lower bound. So really, there's not one single nice function of x that bounds our y values from below. And the same is true for the x values. If we imagine moving left to right, the x values are always bounded above by the large circular arc, but the lower bound is sometimes given by the y-axis and sometimes given by the small circular arc. So what do we do? How do we integrate over a region like this? Well, there are a couple options here. Option one would be to try to subdivide your region into pieces that are a little bit nicer to work with. You could then integrate over each piece separately and add the results. This is what Mobius refers to as the decomposition theorem. In this example, we could probably try cutting the region at x equals 1. If we slice the region vertically, we get two pieces. Let's call them d1 and d2. To integrate over d1, well, y is nicely bounded between the two circular arcs. y goes from the square root of 1 minus x squared to the square root of 4 minus x squared. All the while, x moves between 0 and 1. Then we would have to add the integral over d2. In this case, y is bounded between the x-axis, y equals 0, and that larger circular arc, y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared, and x now runs from 1 to 2. So there you go. This is one setup for tackling our double integral. But the integrals here still look a little bit messy. Instead, I'm going to show you a classy alternative using a result you may remember from the lessons, the change of variables formula. As a quick reminder, here's the statement of the change of variable theorem. Now I'm not going to walk you through every part of this statement because it's something that you would have seen on Mobius, but I will try to summarize what this result allows us to do. The setup is we have some region dxy living in the xy plane. We also have this continuous mapping f, it's a change of variables from the uv plane to the xy plane. What this function is doing is it's transforming some region on the right, duv, into our region dxy, and it's doing this in an invertible way. Effectively, f allows us to think of each point xy in our region in terms of these other variables u and v. The change of variable theorem then says that if you're trying to calculate the double integral of a function throughout this region in the xy plane, you could instead make some modifications to your integral and integrate a related function over this region in the uv plane. Specifically, let's suppose that we're trying to integrate a function gxy throughout this region dxy. We could instead integrate over this region duv, but we have to make some changes to our integrand. Of course, we're going to have to change the x and y terms in here into u's and v's. That's what's happening here. We also have to throw in this extra term, the absolute value of the Jacobian, partial xy by partial uv. This term accounts for any distortions in area that occur when we change coordinate systems. Now the advantage here, folks, is that the integral on the right may be much nicer than the integral on the left. It could be the case that the bounds are easy to describe in the uv plane, or maybe the integrand itself simplifies dramatically. Let's see how we can use this result in our example. 
Okay, back to our problem. We've agreed that this region D isn't too friendly to work with in terms of X and Y, but perhaps we can describe it more simply in a different coordinate system. We could then use our change of variable theorem to evaluate our double integral. Hmm, well this region is bounded between two circular arcs in the first quadrant of R2. Ah, if we're dealing with circular arcs, polar coordinates is usually a good choice. Remember, in polar coordinates, x can be described as r cos theta, and y can be described as r sine theta. What are these variables r and theta doing throughout our region? Well, remember, theta is the angle our points make with the positive x-axis, and it looks like we could achieve any angle between theta equals 0, the x-axis, and theta equals pi over 2, the y-axis. So theta goes between 0 and pi over 2. What about r? What's r doing as we move through this region? Well, remember, r represents the distance from a point to the origin. If we fix an angle theta and we move directly away from the origin at this angle theta, we see that the points throughout our region always have an r value bigger than 1, bigger than the radius of this circle, but less than 2, less than the radius of this circle. So r goes from 1 to 2. What we've just done is we've come up with a description for our domain D in terms of two new variables, r and theta. We found a way to view D in the r theta plane, and the description is much nicer. Theta goes from 0 to pi over 2, and r goes between 1 and 2. We're dealing with a rectangle. It doesn't get much nicer than that. So if we apply our change of variables formula to calculate this double integral, well now we're going to be integrating over this region in the r theta plane. We're going to have the integral from theta equals 0 to theta equals pi over 2, the integral from r equals 1 to 2, and now we have to rewrite our integrand. The integrand is currently expressed in terms of x's and y's, but we want r's and theta's. We can accomplish this using our conversion formulas. We could replace x with r cos theta and y with r sine theta. But in this case, it's actually a little easier. Remember that in polar coordinates, r squared is simply x squared plus y squared. And we have x squared plus y squared sprinkled throughout our function. So I could rewrite this as e to the square root of r squared divided by the square root of r squared and of course, we have to multiply by the absolute value of our Jacobian, the absolute value of partial xy over partial r theta. On the next slide, we'll compute this Jacobian and wrap up our calculations. Okay, here's where we left off. To compute our Jacobian, we have to look at the matrix of partial derivatives. The first column contains derivatives with respect to r, the second column contains derivatives with respect to theta. We're looking for the determinant of this matrix. Now I'm not going to work through all the steps since this is a computation you've seen on Mobius already, but you should get something like this, giving a final answer of r. Now of course with polar coordinates you don't have to re-derive this every time. If you can remember that the Jacobian is r, you're welcome to use that for free in your calculations. The absolute value won't change it since r is assumed to be a non-negative quantity. So we get the integral from 0 to pi over 2, of the integral from 1 to 2, of e to the r over r, times r dr d theta. The r's cancel out, and the integral becomes very, very simple to evaluate. You should get a final answer of pi over 2 times e squared minus e. All right, I've got one more example for you. In this problem, we're looking at a thin, flat steel plate occupying this region d in the xy plane. So we're given some boundary curves, and the region they enclose represents our plate. We'd like to determine the total mass of the plate, assuming that at the point x, y, its mass density is x plus y squared over x squared kilograms per meters squared. Ooh, this seems like a pretty involved problem. Where do we start? Well, it'll be helpful to first remember the connection between an object's total mass and its mass density. This is one of our interpretations of the double integral. If we want to know the total mass of our object throughout d, we need to calculate the double integral over d of the mass density function sigma xy. Okay, well that's all well and good, but I don't really want to integrate over this region. This looks pretty complicated. We could try separating it using the decomposition theorem and calculating a few separate double integrals, but that sounds like a lot of work. Instead, I'm going to try to find a change of variables that will allow us to transform this region into something much friendlier. The big question is, 
What change of variables should we use? Well, the general strategy here is going to be to look at your boundary equations. If you can rewrite these equations to obtain expressions involving x and y that are nicely bounded between constants, well, you can define those expressions to be your new variables, u and v. When we view this region d in the uv plane, u and v are then going to be bounded between constants. We're going to obtain a rectangle, just like we had in the last example. So let me show you how this is done. If we look at the equations of these downward sloping lines, we could rewrite them by moving x to the other side. We could write them as x plus y equals 2 and x plus y equals 4. Ah, so the region between these lines consists of all points x, y, where x plus y is between 2 and 4. So perhaps x plus y is a good choice for one of our new variables. What about these other lines? Well, I could rewrite them by dividing both sides by x. I could rewrite this line as y over x equals 1, and I could write this line as y over x equals 2. Ah, so the region in between consists of all points where y over x is between 1 and 2. Perhaps now we can see what transformation will be useful. If we set u equal to one of these expressions, let's say y over x, and we set v to be the other expression, x plus y, then in the uv plane, we can think of this region d as all points where u is between 1 and 2, and v is between 2 and 4. A very nice rectangular region. Okay, as a quick recap, we're looking for the total mass of our plate, which is given by the double integral of the mass density function throughout this region d. To simplify our calculations, we found a change of variables that turns this ugly region into a very nice rectangular region duv. We'd now like to apply our change of variable theorem to calculate this double integral in the simpler uv setting. The only trouble is, in the statement of the change of variable theorem, we're supposed to be working with a transformation from the uv plane to the xy plane. That is not what we have here. Here we have the inverse transformation, the transformation from xy to uv. So what do we do? Well, one option would be to try to invert this transformation. Try to find the transformation going in the other direction by expressing x and y in these equations in terms of u and v. Now that'll work, but it's a bit more effort than is actually needed here. In certain situations, it's possible to solve these problems using this transformation instead. For instance, how would we find the Jacobian? Remember, we have to put in the Jacobian partial xy by partial uv. Normally to calculate this thing, we would have to find the matrix of partial derivatives, right? The partial derivatives of x and y with respect to u and v. But this is a little bit awkward because we don't have x and y in terms of u and v. We have u and v in terms of x and y. Fortunately, there's a way to obtain the Jacobian we're actually interested in using this transformation in the wrong direction. The Jacobian of our transformation is partial uv over partial xy. And the relationship between these is that they're reciprocals of one another. So the Jacobian we want is the reciprocal of this Jacobian that we can actually compute it's going to be 1 over the determinant of this matrix of partial derivatives. The first column has derivatives with respect to x. The second column has derivatives with respect to y. This gives you a matrix that looks something like this. If you calculate the determinant, you should get minus x minus y over x squared. And therefore, the reciprocal of this quantity is what we're actually looking for. Our Jacobian is minus x squared over x plus y. Let's see how we can use this to wrap up our calculations. All right, folks, we know what our region looks like in the UV plane, and we found our Jacobian. We're therefore ready to apply our change of variable theorem. Rather than computing this double integral over D to find the total mass, I'm instead going to compute a double integral over this region, DUV. What function am I integrating? Well, I'm supposed to integrate the density function sigma xy, which I'll remind you is x plus y squared over x squared. Of course, I have to multiply by the absolute value of my Jacobian, the absolute value of partial xy over partial uv. And now I'm integrating du dv. Now I know what you're thinking. Zach, hold on a second. If you're integrating with respect to u and v, why do you still have x's and y's in your integral? 
Well, you make a good point. At the end of the day, we shouldn't have X's and Y's. We should convert everything over to U's and V's. At this point, you might not have much choice. You may have to invert this transformation to express X and Y in terms of U and V. But in this case, I think we might be able to avoid it if we're a little sneaky. Before I make the conversion to U and V, I'm gonna substitute my Jacobian in terms of X and Y. Watch what happens. When I take the absolute value of this expression, this negative is gonna go away, right? So I get the integral from V equals two to V equals four the integral from u equals one to u equals two of x plus y squared over x squared times x squared over x plus y du dv. Here's where the magic happens. A lot of stuff in my integrand simplifies, and the only thing that I'm left with is x plus y, which I'll remind you is v. So in this example, by substituting the Jacobian first before we make all the conversions, we were actually able to simplify things quite a bit. We simply end up with the integral from two to four of the integral from one to two of v du dv. And I'll let you verify that this gives you a total mass of six kilograms.